It's a beautiful day, and it's wonderful to have you joining me here listening to Chapter 11's first lecture covering liquids and intermolecular forces. Before beginning, I would like to share with you a fun, and it might not really be that fun, fact about another chemical compound that honestly has nothing to do with this topic. I just share it with you because I think it's cool. But don't worry, you don't have to memorize it or anything. I'm not putting it on a test. A bacavir, whose structure is shown right here, is an antiretroviral drug. When a virus like HIV tries to manufacture DNA from its viral RNA, the virus unknowingly incorporates a bacavir, this molecule, instead of a natural component of DNA called guanosine, whose structure is shown here. A bacavir then stops the virus from reproducing. You can hopefully see the structural similarities between these two molecules. Once again, you can imagine the virus incorporating a bacavir instead of guanosine when it tries to manufacture its DNA, thereby halting the virus's ability to reproduce. This is one of the cool applications of molecular structure drug technology. With this random factoid now said, which I happen to have borrowed from the American Chemical Society's website, let's begin. After today's presentation, which covers sections one and two from our text, you should be able to understand the physical differences between solids, liquids, and gases, and describe each of the following intermolecular forces and sort them by relative strength. Dipole-dipole, hydrogen bonding, ion dipole, and dispersion forces. So in essence, this lecture is going to be more or less completely about intermolecular forces, which while being fundamental are also extraordinarily important to understand. Let's get started. As we learned back in chapter 10, I'll post a link here to it, gas molecules are widely separated and are in a state of constant chaotic motion. Liquids and solids, however, are quite different because their intermolecular forces, the forces that kind of stick the individual molecules together, are much stronger. In liquids, the intermolecular attractive forces are strong enough to hold the particles close together. Thus, liquids are much denser and far less compressible than gases. Unlike gases, liquids have a definite volume, not a definite shape, but a definite volume, which is completely independent of the size and shape of their containers. The attractive forces in liquids are not strong enough, however, to keep their particles from moving past one another. Thus, any liquid can be poured and assumes the shape of the container that it occupies. Solids, by comparison, have intermolecular attractive forces that are strong enough to virtually lock them in place. Solids, like liquids, are not very compressible. In other words, you can't squish them down very much because their particles have very little free space between them. The particles of a solid are not free to undergo long-range movement, which makes them rigid. The atoms in solids, however, do vibrate in place and are constantly in motion. As temperature increases, these vibrational motions also increase. These similarities and differences between gases, liquids, and solids can be encapsulated in this beautiful table from our book, which you're welcome to review. With that in mind, the table that I've created right here shows the different names for changing physical states. A similar table is also found in our text. If, for example, you convert a solid into a liquid, it's called melting. OK, you probably know that, and you've probably seen that happen. If you convert a liquid to a solid, however, what's it called? It's called freezing. OK, nothing new there. What if I change a liquid to a gas? What is that called? Well, it's called vaporization or boiling, sometimes called evaporating. And if I go the reverse, gas to a liquid, what do we call that? Yeah, we call it condensation or condensing. OK, what about this, though? What if I change a solid directly to a gas? We don't see that as often, but it does happen. You might have seen, for example, dry ice, which is solid CO2. It converts directly from a solid to a gas at ambient temperatures and pressures without ever going through a liquid phase. What do we call that process? Well, that is called sublimation. And what happens in the rare circumstances where some substance goes in the reverse, that is, turns directly from a gas to a solid without ever going through the liquid phase, what do we call that? Well, that is called deposition. I admit that these last two terms are probably ones that you're not quite as familiar with in your everyday lives. That brings us to a great, if not intellectually insulting, lecture question. Which is the lowest boiling point, first between a gas and a liquid, and second between a liquid and a solid? Now, I realize this might seem very rudimentary, but I hope you'll make sure that you know how to answer it so that you have a firm grasp on how to relate boiling point to physical state. Here's another one. Please arrange the following substances in order of increasing boiling point. Carbon tetrachloride, silicon, and argon. Now I'll give you a hint, but not the answer. The one that's a solid of these at standard temperature and pressure is the one that's going to have the highest boiling point. It's not sitting as a gas normally. It's all solid and stuck together. The one that's a gas normally under standard temperature and pressure is the one that's going to have the lowest boiling point. It's already a gas. 
and the one that's a liquid is going to be in between. So what you really need to do is determine what the natural physical state is of each of these substances at standard temperature and pressure. That brings us then to this all-important fundamental topic of intermolecular forces. As it turns out, there are a couple of different intermolecular forces I'm going to teach you. The first one is called dipole-dipole. Here's my explanation of what that means. When you have a molecule that has a polar bond in it, remember a polar bond is one in which two different atoms have a significant difference in their electronegativities. Not so significant that's, that it's an ionic bond, but just one where there's a partial negative and a partial positive charge. When you have that kind of bond, it causes the molecule, once again, to have a partial negative charge on one atom and a partial positive charge on another. When molecules like this cluster together, they line up and stick together in a complementary fashion like this. This is the example of hydrochloric acid. Chlorine is much more electronegative than hydrogen, so it hogs the electrons towards itself, thereby giving it a very strong partial negative charge, leaving the hydrogen as a very strong partial positive charge. When you have a bunch of HCl molecules all together in a soup, the HCls will line up in a complementary fashion so that the partially negatively charged chlorines are pointing or kind of sticking to partially positively charged hydrogens and vice versa. This force is once again called a dipole force. And this force, this stickiness between molecules, is what gives HCl its relatively high boiling point compared to molecules that have weaker intermolecular forces. The second force I'll teach you is hydrogen bonding. Now, when a hydrogen atom is bonded to a nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine, those three magical elements and those alone, it forms a special type of dipole-dipole force called a hydrogen bond. In this example, we can see water. Once again, oxygen, as well as nitrogen and fluorine, are so much more electronegative than hydrogen that when they bond to hydrogen, they form a very strong dipole. It's not an ionic bond. It's still covalent, but it's a very, very strong dipole where there's a much more partially negative charge on the oxygen and a much more partially positive charge on the hydrogen than there would be in the example HCl that I just showed you. So similar to the HCl example, water molecules will line up and stack on each other in a complementary fashion, pointing their partially negatively charged oxygens at the neighboring partially positively charged hydrogens and vice versa in all directions. This is what's going on at a molecular level if you were able to look very, very closely at a cup of water. Zillions of molecules, and zillions isn't technically a word, but it's a lot of molecules with uh, this kind of thing happening in a complementary stacking effect in all directions. Furthermore, this intermolecular force is what contributes to water's extremely high boiling point relative to molecules that have weaker intermolecular forces. Think about it. You have to heat a bucket of water to 100 degrees Celsius, which is really hot, to get the molecules in it to start wiggling around enough that they'll break apart and then start escaping as gas. That's really high, especially when compared to molecules that have weaker intermolecular forces that I'll talk about momentarily. This slide shows analogous pictures of hydrogen bonding involving fluorines and nitrogens. You can also have hydrogen bonding occurring between nitrogen and oxygen containing compounds or analogously between nitrogen and fluorine containing compounds or oxygen and fluorine or oxygen and nitrogen or any combination of the above. This video, which I highly recommend you watch and to which I'll post a link right here, helps show that in a visually stimulating way.